You know, when I was a kid, I thought the Gold Key line was the worst comic book line ever. But now that I've read a few of their books and done some research, I'm really starting to warm up to them. Gold Key was the comic book brand for the Western Publishing Company. Gold Key began in 1962, but Western had been around since the dawn of comics and even way before that. Western Publishing and Lithographing was founded in 1907, and believe it or not, this company had a huge impact on American culture. In the 1920s, the Whitman jigsaw puzzles were some of the very first jigsaw puzzles to be printed on paper. And prior to that, jigsaw puzzles were printed on wood, which made them expensive. And printing on paper made them affordable for the middle class, which actually led to them becoming popular. Another thing that Western did in the 1920s was that they pioneered boxed board top games. And like jigsaw puzzles, Western didn't invent boxed board top games, but they made them affordable for everyone. And in addition to puzzles and board games, they also printed playing cards. And in 1932, they experimented with comics. They produced the first Big Little books, which were the collected reprints of the Dick Tracy newspaper strip. In 1933, Western made another amazing move when they won exclusive merchandising rights to all Disney characters. And this filled their coffers with Mickey Mouse money. With the success of the Disney merchandising, Western went on to sign an exclusive contract with Warner Brothers, which gave them characters like Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, and Porky Pig. In 1934, Western was in a partnership with the Eastman Color Printing Company, and they were there when the very first comic books came off the presses. Their association with Eastman only lasted a couple of years, but they were part of the picture when Famous Bunnies No. 1 rolled off the printing press. After they broke with Eastman, they entered into a partnership with Dell Comics, and this turned into one of the most profitable collaborations in comics ever. All of the Disney and Warner Brothers characters were made available to Dell. For the next two decades, Dell would be the undisputed top seller in comics. They sold more than DC, Fawcett, Timely, EC, or any other Golden Age publisher. Just to give you an idea how successful they were, in 1953, the comic book industry was falling apart. Two distributors had gone out of business, and Dell still sold an astounding 26 million copies a month. Yes, you heard that right, 26 million copies a month. Like with Eastman, the partnership with Dell came to an end, and it did so in 1962. Western had decided to start their own comic book company, and they took their exclusive publishing rights with Disney and Warner Brothers with them. The Gold Key line started in 1962, and they took full advantage of their merchandising opportunities, especially in television. They printed comics featuring TV shows like The Man From U.N.C.L.E., My Favorite Martian, and The Munsters. Probably the most notable of these television tie-ins was that they produced the first Star Trek comics. They acquired the rights to Hanna-Barbera cartoons, and this gave them characters like the Flintstones and Space Ghost, and then they inked deals with King Feature Syndicate getting their hands on Flash Gordon and the Phantom. Most of their titles were merchandise tie-ins, but they did have a small stable of in-house superhero and action characters. So now, let's take a quick peek at a few of those original Gold Key heroes. It's appropriate we begin with Gold Key's first superhero, Dr. Solar. Dr. Solar was quite shocking at the time of its release because it's credited as the first comic book with a 12 cent cover price. Dr. Solar is the creation of the team of writer Paul S. Newman, editor Matt Murphy, and artist Bob Fujitani. Later notable contributors include writer Otto Binder and artist Ernie Cologne. Dr. Philip Solar is caught in a life and death situation during a nuclear power plant meltdown. The power plant has been sabotaged by Dr. Rasp, and Rasp has been paid off by an evil supervillain named Neuro. Dr. Solar saves the day, but he absorbs an incredible amount of radiation. Instead of being killed, Solar becomes a human nuclear battery. He has the ability to absorb and discharge energy. He no longer eats food. He gets his energy by draining energy from other sources for sustenance. 
His skin turns green when he uses his powers, and he also has the ability to change atom structures. And in rare cases, he can even travel through time. Neuro, his arch foe, goes through an interesting transformation. He builds a robot named Oron, and later in the series, he transfers his mind into Oron and changes his name to King Cybernoid. Dr. Solar's popularity peaked in 1965, and that year, Gold Key raised the cover price from 12 to 15 cents. And this had a huge impact on sales. A sales slide began which led to the series coming to an end in 1969. Over a decade later, Gold Key would bring back Dr. Solar under the team of Ross McKenzie and Dan Spiegel. But unfortunately, this run would only last for four issues. And in case you haven't put two and two together yet, Dr. Solar was a major inspiration for Alan Moore when he created Dr. Manhattan of the Watchmen. Probably the most popular character to come out of the Gold Key line is Magnus, Robot Fighter. In the year 4000, mankind is totally dependent on robots. A robot police chief named H8 or Hate wants to increase that dependency. He wants to take away mankind's ability to think and live for themselves. A robot named 1A raises a human boy in an undersea dome house. From birth, he's trained in science, robotics, and martial arts. But most of all, he's taught to think for himself. When he's ready, Magnus is brought to the mega city of North Am. And North Am is a single city that covers the entire continent of North America. And there he begins fighting evil robots and the people behind them. In his adventures, he's joined by his telepathic girlfriend, Lija. Magnus was the creation of writer-artist Russ Manning. And before doing Magnus, Manning was working on the Tarzan newspaper strip. Some elements of Tarzan are borrowed for Magnus. For example, the idea of Magnus being raised and acquiring skills outside of civilization is a major influence from Tarzan. Another major influence on Magnus was Isaac Asimov. Asimov was a pioneer in science fiction. His 1950 collection of short stories and essays, I, Robot, had a major influence on almost all science fiction that came afterwards. His three laws of robotics play heavily into the Magnus storyline. Creator Russ Manning wrote and drew the first 21 issues. Then other writers and artists took over. Magnus Robot Fighter lasted until 1977. As beautiful as Venus, as fierce as any creature in the jungle is, Tiger Girl. Tiger Girl was the creation of Superman scribe Jerry Siegel and veteran freelance artist Jack Sparling. No origin is given for Tiger Girl. She faces off against costume villains such as the Growler and the Wolfhound. And both of these bad guys work for an evil organization called Infamy, I-N-F-A-M-Y. But no definition of what those letters stand for is ever given. In addition to fighting costume bad guys, she also has to fight off the male chauvinism of secret agent Ed Savage. He works for a national security agency called WAVE, W-A-A-V. And the letters of this organization are given. Uh, they stand for the War Against Arch Villainy. In real life, Tiger Girl is Lily Taylor, and she is an aerialist in a traveling circus. She has a mental link with a tiger named Kitten, and she also gets support from a couple of other circus performers. A clown called Laughing Boy and a strong man known as Titan help her in her adventures. A major subplot of Tiger Girl is that strong man Titan is secretly in love with Lily, but she ignores him, choosing to banter back and forth with secret agent Ed Savage. Tiger Girl only lasted for one issue in 1967. She made no further appearances after that. In 1972, Gold Key introduced Dr. Spectre. Dr. Spectre was an occult detective, and along with his secretary slash love interest Lakota Rainflower, he fought vampires, ghosts, witches, and werewolves. Speaking of werewolves, one storyline had the good doctor turning into a werewolf for a number of issues, and another storyline had a repeating villain named Baron Tiber, 
who was a stand-in for Dracula. <laughs> Dr. Spectre was the creation of Don Glut. Glut created a number of characters in the Gold Key line, and he took the opportunity with Dr. Spectre to create crossover stories. And many of these crossover stories included the likes of Dr. Solar, The Owl, and Dagar. In a future apocalyptic world, shaped by nuclear war, one man stands to defend the city of New York. New York, of course, is the city we know in our time as New York City. The Mighty Samson was the creation of writer Otto Binder. Binder is best remembered for writing over 900 stories in the original Captain Marvel run. Binder also created Supergirl for DC Comics as well as the Superman villain Brainiac. He was also an accomplished sci-fi writer. The artwork was done by Frank Thorne, and Thorne is best remembered for his renderings of Red Sonja at Marvel Comics. In this story, Samson is injured defending the city and is blinded in one eye. He is nursed back to health by the beautiful Charmaine and her father, Mindor. The city of New York is constantly under threat by an evil scientist named Terra, who is also the Queen of Jurors. Of course, Jurors is the ruins of the area we call New Jersey. Original Mighty Samson stories ran from 1964 to 1978, and reprints ran from 1978 to 1982. Our next gold key character is Dagar, or is it pronounced Dagar, or Dagger? I don't know what what's his name. How do you pronounce that? Dagar. D well, anyway, we're going with Dagar. Dagar is the creation of Donald Glut and Jesse Santos, and Dagar made his first appearance in 1972, and he was published until 1976. This blonde-haired Conan the Barbarian clone lives in a world of sword and sorcery. Of course, he does. And in the first issue, he was originally called Durak. His story is very similar to that of Conan the Barbarian. As a child, he saw the destruction of his people, and after reaching adulthood, he's now seeking revenge against a sorcerer with no name. We don't get a lot of details about his origin because it only appears a couple of times in splash page narration boxes. In his adventures, you'll find Dagar fighting all sorts of monsters and demons, and rescuing pretty damsels from them. Many of the stories are very similar to Conan. There's throne room politics, usurpers, and evil sorcerers in the mix. Our next character is Trag. The story of Trag is set in a prehistoric earth where dinosaurs still walk the land. Trag is the result of an alien experiment. Aliens land on earth and discover Neanderthals. Finding them too primitive to put to work, the aliens use their DNA to create a workforce of slaves. Trag is the first Cro-Magnon man. The aliens also create a mate for him named Lorna. The story of Trag begins when he and Lorna escape the confines of the alien compound. In the outside world, they find themselves fighting Neanderthals, running from dinosaurs, and hiding from the aliens that created them. This was another creation of Donald Glut, and he teamed up again with Jesse Santos to bring this comic to life. Trag made his first appearance in 1975, but the series only lasted for two years. In 1982, a couple of books were reprinted under the Whitman Comics banner, and these were some of the last books Whitman would produce before the line came to an end. Turok, Son of Stone, was first illustrated by Rex Mason, but it is unclear who the writer is. Historians generally believe that it is either Matthew Murphy or Gaylord Dubois. Turok made his first appearance in 1954 under the Dell brand. Turok is set in a pre-Columbian North America, and his stories take place in what is modern-day New Mexico. Turok and his younger brother Andor wander into a valley that contains dinosaurs. He gives them all sorts of clever names such as Rammers and Honkers. In 1992, he was revived by Valiant Comics and this time his adventures take place in the Lost Lands, and he finds himself facing demons and aliens in addition to fighting dinosaurs. In 1967, Gold Key produced two issues of The Owl. The Owl is another character who got his start at Dell Comics. 
He's an early superhero who made his first appearance in Cracker Jack Funnies way back in 1940. Nick Terry is a police detective. He puts on his owl costume to protect the citizens of Yorktown. His first adventures have him as a solo crime fighter, but later he's joined by a female sidekick named Owl Girl. Like a lot of the Golden Age superheroes, his run ended in the mid-1940s. In the 1960s, when the Batman TV show became a pop culture sensation, Gold Key tried to capitalize by bringing back the Owl. They also brought back the Owl Girl with a new alter ego to reflect the times. These stories, of course, are very tongue-in-cheek parody adventures. The person scripting this revival was none other than Superman co-creator Jerry Siegel, and the art was done by Tom Gill, who is best known for drawing The Lone Ranger. The Owl's last gold key appearance happened in the 1970s, when he appeared in an issue of Dr. Spectre. Another original title worth mentioning is Mars Patrol. Long before the G.I. Joe team, the Mars Attack Rescue Service was saving the world from alien invaders. The team is made up of four super soldiers, and each one wears a different colored uniform to denote their expertise in warfare. Lieutenant Cy Adams is the field commander. He is an accomplished leader and pilot. Sergeant Joe Stryker is a demolitions expert and paratrooper. Sergeant Ken Hero is a scuba diver and martial artist, and Corporal Russ Stacy is a weapons expert and commando. Together, they defend the Earth from alien invaders. The aliens are humanoid, looking very similar to humans with the exception that they are hairless. And when referring to the aliens, the team often uses racial slurs, calling them skinheads or baldies. The aliens arrive on Earth through some sort of teleportation device, and the team never knows when they will appear or disappear. Another aspect of this series is that the Mars Patrol team battles the aliens using all sorts of exotic vehicles and aircraft. Highlights of this series is that the first three issues are drawn by Wally Wood, and the series won an Alley Award in 1965 for Best Normal Group Adventure. Huh, I had no idea such a category existed. The end of Gold Key happened in the mid-1980s. The comic book industry had moved to direct sales in comic book shops, and the spinner racks disappeared from the grocery and drug stores, but Gold Key decided to stick with those older outlets. They quit monthly title production and sold their books in plastic bag bundles. Their last new major title was a television tie-in with the NBC show Buck Rogers in the 25th Century. In 1979, they produced 16 issues of that title. In 1982, the Gold Key label was replaced with the Whitman Comics logo, and at that time, Western used the Whitman banner for their coloring book and children's line. This Whitman line limped on for two more years, putting out comic book bundles for grocery stores. And then, without any fanfare, they disappeared. Of course, these characters are still with us today. Magnus, Dr. Solar, and Turok were revived by Valiant. Dark Horse had a go with them. And the last I heard, these characters were under contract with Dynamite Entertainment, but I honestly don't know what Dynamite has done with them. When I was a kid, I did not like the Gold Key line. Um, I considered it a kiddie line, and by like age 11, I was way too sophisticated for them. Um, but uh, after discovering these characters, I now think they had some really nice stories to tell. And looking at them right now, I think that this line could be an amazing opportunity for some media company or streaming service or video game company. This is a pretty unique group of characters with interesting storylines. You know, the costume superhero uh, genre for film and television is getting stale and predictable. And traditionally, a film genre only has a 15 to 20 year window of popularity and then the door closes on it. This happened to the buddy cop movies, the boy meet girl rom-coms, or the teenage coming of age comedies that uh, I grew up on. They all had about a 15 to 20 year window. And it's feeling like it's time for a change with superheroes. Uh, I watched the recent Batman and Spider-Man films and I watched the Peacemaker on HBO and I liked them, but my excitement level just isn't there. Uh, my interest level just wasn't there. And don't hate me for that. I still like the superhero genre. It's just that it's getting really stale and predictable. 
And if a media company could get their hands on this line in particular, um, this would give them a wide array of genres and characters to work with. And for some of these gold key, <clears throat> excuse me, and for some of these gold key characters, their time is right now. Uh, for example, I'll give you a quick example here. Uh, for the story of Magnus Robot Fighter is probably more relevant today than back when he was created because it, it touches a lot of hot topic issues such as AI, cybernetics, and uh, humanity's dependence on computers. And these are all topics that are only going to grow in relevancy in the near future. Uh, another thing that we all know that's going on, it's been big for a number of years in Hollywood, is the representation of underrepresented minorities. Um, there is all sorts of diversity in the gold key line. Who is more underrepresented in Hollywood than Native Americans? And here you have Turok, Son of Stone, set in a pre-Columbian backdrop. And what kid wouldn't want to see Native Americans fighting dinosaurs? I mean, that sounds awesome. It would be like sort of like the TV show Survivor meeting Jurassic Pork, Pork, Jurassic Park. Part of it would be about survival skills in the wild, and the other part would be fighting dinosaurs. I, I would love to see that as a TV show or a video game. Also, there's Dakota Rainflower and Dr. Spectre. And I'm telling you, Dr. Spectre is a concept begging to be put on the screen. Uh, think of this. Think of this. This is my pitch. The Witcher, but set in modern times. Whoa! Who doesn't want to see that? Um, there's a, also, there's a history of Supernatural-themed shows having long shelf life. Uh, think of Supernatural or The X-Files. Both of those shows come to my mind. I love those kind of shows. And I think the popularity would still be there for a new version of those. And getting back to Dr. Specter with Dakota Rainflower being Native American, you could also interweave the representation organically into the story as opposed to that heavy hammered approach that turns viewers off that the uh, woke crowd sort of uses. Uh, for example, the monsters could be set in Native American folklore. You could have skinwalkers or Sasquatch or Thunderbirds. And also you could set stories on, on uh, uh, Native American reservations for a backdrop. And there, I'm sure there's all sorts of uh, uh, unique stories that can be told from that angle. <clears throat> My throat's starting to go out. <laughs> if I can keep going on this. And think about this, too. There are other characters that I talked about in this video. Trag and the Sky Gods plays right into the popularity of ancient aliens. And I don't know if you've seen the History Channel lately, but they'll dedicate entire weekends to ancient aliens. And Dagar, Dagger, <laughs> Dagger, whatever you want to call him, Dagar, uh, that's a poor man's Conan the Barbarian. You know, it's swords, sorcery, wizards, a magic world, and you can do so much with that. And with the right imagination behind it, it could be the next Lord of the Rings or, uh, 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 or possibly like a Game of Thrones kind of situation. But uh, anyway, with all these characters here, this I think would be great for some streaming line to get their hands on it. I think that these characters, their time is now because the superhero genre, that costume superhero genre is starting to get stale and you need something different to spark it up. And again, you're dealing with science fiction, you're dealing with, uh, in the various forms, you're dealing with Native Americans, you're dealing with uh, all these different backdrops and they're interesting, great stories to tell. This is not a side note. What we should probably do is pull our money together. You know, first of all, keep this between you and me and everyone else that's listening. We should pull our money together and buy this line before some Hollywood person realizes the value of it. And uh, uh, we could flip it like the way some people flip houses. We could flip these intellectual properties over. Shh, keep it, keep it quiet, just between us. And if you're the current owners of this line, uh, just remember who your pitch man is. I expect 3% when the deal closes, and you can send it to my PayPal account, or you could leave it on a duffel bag in my front porch. Either way is good. Well, that's it for me. Thank you for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the Gold Key story. What do you think? Do you think these characters have potential for film or video games? And by the way, I picked up uh, some Dr. Spectre, Trag, Magnus, and Dagar books. They're interesting. They're enjoyable. You might want to give them a try. Check out your local comic book shop. I picked up quite a few books, and I got them pretty cheap. I was paying between two and five dollars for a lot of them and some of them were like near mint copies too. And before I finally go, please remember to hit the like button. Also, you can support the channel at Patreon, PayPal, or get some golden age goodness at my Teespring store. Uh, I started that up so there's some t-shirts there. You can help support the channel and get yourself a great t-shirt. The links are in the description box. Hope to see you again soon with another video. So until next time, stay super. Bye.